I'm going to start recording. Yeah. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, Digital Demos. Tonight, we are having a roundtable discussion featuring uh, previous alumni of Jefferson University, all of which graduated somewhere from within CABE. And they will be here to uh, share their experiences about graduating into the coronavirus pandemic and sort of what it's been like to graduate during it, work, find jobs, and anything else as a general discussion. We are joined by Aaron Young, Zachary Scup, Teresa Sharenza, uh, Madison Cotalis, Gabby DeLulo, Enya Barkia, um, Michaela Cooley, and Kyle and Derek. <laughs> no last name, just <laughs> Kyle and Derek. Joined together as one person. Um, this event is also co-hosted by AIAS. Um, so we have also here the AIS president, uh, Cynthia Balblitz. And I will uh, open, uh, kind of just start off with letting you guys speak. Um, Aaron, you are the first person on my screen, so we're gonna start with you. Cool, so uh, the question is my experience. Um, so I graduated in 2019, everything was going fine then. I Got a job at a small firm in Jersey, so I've been commuting there since. Um, I'm working there since, and then I guess then coronavirus came, which was about March. That's when uh, our firm started to take action. So that's also when the country took action. Um, we stayed home. And prior to actually the virus, there we already had like software where we could work from home. So like say if there's a big snowstorm, we were able to use this software called Remote PC to just basically use our computers at home to work on our desktop. Um, so we were pretty much prepared. We just had to, you know, fix up some nuts and bolts to basically be able to work as good as if we were in the office. Um, so I think in some way, this is probably not, in some ways it was a good thing, the coronavirus, because, you know, you know, I don't have to commute anymore. I live in PA and I was driving 40 minutes to go to Jersey to work. Um, so that's like almost an hour and a half. I don't have to um, spend driving, I can save money on food, um, but it does get lonely. Um, don't see my coworkers as much. Um, and then there's things like, you know, doing surveys, which is a little bit more difficult. You can't go out at the same time to go into a building without having like prior approval and stuff. Um, and you also can't just like walk into your boss's office to ask him any questions for like when you're drafting and stuff. Um, so there's ups and downs, but kind of balances out. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to just kind of go through everyone first for efficiency and then we'll kind of go to questions later. Um, so Zach, you are the next up on my screen. Uh, okay, H hello everyone. Um, I graduated in December, 2019 uh, with architectural studies, so not necessarily design, um, but I, you know, was kind of lax on trying to find the job for the first couple of months. Uh, yeah, I didn't expect the coronavirus, so I was kind of like, hmm, I don't have to pay my student loans back until, uh, you know, September. Um, and then, and so I was kind of looking, uh, put out some applications, you know, was picking which ones I wanted to go to, uh, and, you know, and then everything hit in March, and it was tough. I was not getting nearly as many callbacks. Uh, there was less and less jobs. Um, I was looking for a job both in Colorado and 
uh, in New Jersey. Um, and I really didn't get anything. Uh, and then kind of a little miracle happened. Um, I found a job in real estate that I really like. Uh, I moved out to Colorado for this job. Um, what I do is I travel across the United States and inspect multifamily housing units for life safety issues. I generate reports, deliver them to the property management, the asset managers, uh, and have them follow up on resolutions 21 days after uh, doing my inspections. Um, the toughest thing I would have to say was, uh, you know, I got a lot of rejection when, especially during March, April, May, uh, June, you know, it wasn't until July that I finally was able to get an interview and then eventually got the job uh, in August. So, you know, I would say, you know, just kind of stick with it. Don't, don't take it too hard on yourself. It's, it's a tough time right now, but, you know, hopefully things are starting to recover now that we have a vaccine and everything. Thank you, Zach. Teresa, you're up next. Okay. Um, so I graduated last spring. So I had a couple of months of school uh, from home and then graduated. I participated, well, I, the, I, I planned to participate in Design Expo um, and didn't hear from any firms for like an eternity. Um, and I was applying places and doing my best um, to try to like find something. And I ended up not, I did get a job um, and I actually got my job through Design Expo. It was just delayed. Um, so, I mean, I think this year it'll be a little, a little different because more firms are looking to hire. Um, everyone's sort of like back in the swing of things. Um, but yeah, so I, I didn't start my job until June and we started, they started me part-time because they were trying to figure out how to give me direction and train me with like their whole system without having me do nothing for hours at a time. Um, so that actually worked out pretty well. I worked like a three day work week for a little bit and then started full time once I had a grasp on things. Um, and I've been there ever since. So I work at TV Bot Architecture, which is in Wilmington. And it, similar um, to Aaron, it kind of worked out for me. They, they usually would have had me like start um, in the office for the first few weeks. And then they have a co-working space in Philly, which now they don't because co-working is like the worst concept right now. <laughs> um, so I didn't end up having to go to Wilmington at all, which was really nice. And it was actually a pretty smooth transition. I work in an office of mostly young people. So like the oldest person in my office is one of the principals and he's in his fifties. And the other two principals are in there like 30s, 40s, I'm not sure how old they are. So it's been really, really easy to communicate just via Teams or anything like that. And my boss and I will just like create a virtual studio environment where we just sit on a call with each other for like three hours and like we don't talk for half of it, um, which is really nice. Um, so that's been a really, really good environment to be in. Um, that's, that's it for me. All right, thank you very much, Maddie. Hi, so um, I graduated last May of 2020 um, with an interior design degree. Um, I managed to get one interview out of Design Expo, um, but nothing ever came of it. I never heard from them again. <laughs> um, so over the summer, I kind of just spent time like reaching out to people. Um, but again, um, as it was mentioned, like got a lot of rejection and just like didn't hear from a lot of people. Um, so I spent most of my summer just not really doing that much. I didn't work. Um, but luckily I already had, um, enrolled in a master's program at Jefferson. Um, so I kind of had that to look forward to in the spring. It was also having me like not stress out as much about having a full-time job. Um, but over the summer, I was actually reached out to from a faculty member, um, about a part-time position cause she knew I was going to do part-time cause I was going to grad school. Um, so that was really helpful and like, helped me get in contact with um, someone that I actually work for now. I work for a um, small architect, uh, residential architect in uh, Philly, uh, just part-time. Um, so 
Also, I was reached out to from another professor about doing part-time work. So one of my biggest pieces of advice would be to make sure that you form good relationships with your faculty and professors because you never know when they're going to be able to help you out because it really, really helped me out or else I probably wouldn't have um, a job right now. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I'm at, just working like 15 to 20 hours a week on top of grad school part-time. Um, and yeah, that's kind of where I am. <laughs> Thank you very much. Gabby? Hi, guys. Um, so I graduated in May as well in May 2020 with an interior design degree with Maddie. I didn't go to grad school, but um, I was offered, I had two job offers in March saying that I would start in June once I graduated. And I was like, oh, I can start in June. But then, you know, the pandemic never ended. So... I um, never got those jobs because unfortunately they didn't need me because work never really started up. So um, similarly to Maddie, I pretty much stayed home and chilled for the summer. But there were like moments where I had interviews because I did continue to look and search and like keep connections and I kept reaching out to the firms that um, I did have the job offers at. And so that was good at least. And then in um, September, end of September, basically October, I found a residential job. Um, I live in New York with my family. So I'm like on the border of New York and Connecticut. So I found a job in Greenwich, Connecticut doing super, super high end residential work. But it's unfortunately, it's not even really design. It's more like, I hate to say it, but decorating. So, I mean, better than nothing, but <laughs> that's where I am right now. I actually did have a job interview this week, so fingers crossed that works out, but we'll see. It's not bad. Better than nothing. Oh, I think a lot of things are better than nothing uh, right <laughs> now. Um, and yeah, you're up next. You're, uh, you're currently <laughs> muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Great. So similar to Gabby, uh, interviews like began in March. Uh, I had an interview in New York, so I traveled to Philly a week before the shutdown. So, and I was sick during that time. So I'm not sure <laughs> if I had it or not. Um, anyway, uh, I was getting really worried because during the summer, obviously like there was no job and a lot of these companies were saying oh we'll see we'll see we're not hiring right now we can't hire right now and then around june that's when a lot of people a lot of people around me were starting to work already so i was starting to get really worried and then one company around middle of september uh, accepted me and that was the firm here in new york city and a lot of firms that accepted me were outside of new york but because of the pan pandemic i was um iffy about moving um because of money and location and just wanting to stay home and where I was so I accepted that job and so right now I work at a large engineering and architecture company called STV Inc um, and I work in the transportation and infrastructure division and working during a pandemic like the office is relatively empty. A lot of the engineers don't come in because they have families. <laughs> a lot of the young people are the architects. So we're the ones that come in and we're required to come in like three days out of the week and two days to stay at home. But my first two weeks of work, I was really scared because I had no idea what programs they use. Um, and I wanted to get used to like the hang of working with them and you know the computers that they gave me. So I worked like I stayed in the office for two weeks straight. And then after that, that's when I started um, working at home. So building relationships with people are really difficult because you don't get to see them in the office. And in our company, we have an architecture like meeting on Friday morning. So our boss like goes around and asks each of us like what our plans are for the week. Um, and if we have any weekend plans just to catch up on each other. And then I've been able to build really close relationships with the people in my team specifically. So yeah, that's about it. Awesome, uh, Michaela. 
Hello. Um, I graduated with uh, Maddie and Gabby as well um, in the interior design program. Um, just as like a kind of a timeline, uh, we found out basically that we we're going virtual around spring break. Um, so that was kind of hard. I mean, it was kind of cool because it was like extended spring break, but at the same time, a week later, we had to go back to school virtually. Um, so a lot of that uh, really changed for us. And spring break is usually the time I know design expo and stuff was happening then, which I didn't um, actually partake in, but um, I was reaching out to some firms and stuff by myself. Um, and I had a couple offers just like um, everybody else is, has been saying. I think that's the yeah, I just think that's what everybody is, <laughs> the same boat everybody's in. Um, but I um, had been reaching out and reaching out and like each time it was like, okay, well, like we can't start you until like October, like, all right, now we're thinking like possibly next year. And so um, they were like, you know, we just can't give you any, any definite details as to this job. Um, so I actually just accepted a position in November. Well, backtrack, sorry. The summer, I kind of like took off a little bit of time just, you know, kind of de to decompress after finishing out the school year on a pretty low note, I would say. Um, well, finishing out my college career, my on a pretty low note. Um, but um, I have a photography business, so I really focused on that and was able to kind of um, flourish in that a little bit more than what I would have been able to if I had a full-time position as well. Um, but I accepted a position in November for um, Corey View Building Group. So I'm from York County, but I work in Lancaster County and everybody knows Lancaster as Amish country. And all of the people that I work with are ex-Amish actually. So the environment that um, I'm working in is very interesting, very different. Um, it's, we specialize in timber frame, so that's pretty cool. Um, as an interior designer, um, you know, kind of <laughs> shady, shady maple country, yes, that is. <laughs> um, but as, um, yeah, as an uh, interior designer, it, like, you know, it's kind of learning the building structure and learning timber frame and everything else um, is very new to me. Um, so that's been very fun to just kind of learn. Um, Sorry, I'm trying to think of everything. It's you get on the spot then and you like aren't talking to people for like months and then it's like, you know, yeah. But anyways, so um uh yeah, so I'm actually the only designer at um this company. Um we are like a very, very close family. There's 12 of us, um, a lot of hands-on projects, um, can't complain. So it's pretty fun get to design everything so yeah cool. sounds fun thank you Michaela and <laughs> last but not least we have our dynamic duo Kyle and Derek definitely yeah. least yeah. I just want to say I think I think that's a perfect segue into into our little segment here <laughs> so our experiences uh maybe differed a little bit from from some of the cases that we've heard before um so First of all, we get 10 minutes, right? Because is it by frame or by person? By person. By person. Yeah. There we go. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. Because he could log on if he needs. Anyway. Um, yeah. So <laughs> we actually have literally just completed our, our year at um, Osborne Construction, which was a design build firm at this point. Um, and I'm just going to contextualize kind of the, a, a brief summary of our journey, right? So when we first started, um, it was just me. Uh, I was um, currently at the time working, not currently, excuse me. I was at the time working on a, a freelance project and um, I was a little bit stressed out. I was trying to go through interviews and find a steady job. But at the same time, I was trying to like tap my network for whatever I had. So I was busy working on a model for someone that was paying me for a model. And I didn't think I could take on this job by myself. So I brought on Kyle saying like, hey, we could split the job because we're both not ready for a full time because we're still in school, but we could do a part time and, and split the work and get paid uh, fairly, right? So um, <laughs> what ended up happening was we were currently, we were working under two architects at the time. And when the pandemic hit, those two architects ended up splitting. 
Um, and our boss at the time, I don't know why I keep saying at the time. It's like my nervous tick right now. It's because time became pretty irrelevant once we really got in the swing of things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but so we were both brought on to pretty much fill the, the, the gap that the architects had left as a design team. And we quickly realized that there's a lot of mentorship that we had left to learn. Um, that being said, uh, right, we spent a lot of our time working on site and working behind the computer, doing design layouts and um, air sealing, like insulating, doing all the stuff that we draw and end up <laughs> not necessarily realizing the implications of, uh, which was a fantastic learning experience. But why I'm contextualizing this is that we are, as of this week, no longer going to work for this company. It's, it's, um, it's been kind of a, a weird decision and a lot of pressure during this whole pandemic situation, but we realized that we have more to learn and more to gain. And unfortunately this position wasn't giving us what we needed. Yeah. And to just add a little bit to that, a lot of people have, uh, said, you know, after graduation, you know, taking a break and like yeah. thinking about things, you know, living out for a while, we kind of didn't really do that. <laughs> Um, we, we pretty much started full time immediately after graduating and, um, you know, we were carrying a lot of momentum with us cause we had just finished like a solar decathlon and like, you know, we were excited to start our, our careers and, you know, like given the circumstances, like it kind of like was a little bit of like a fire under our asses to just like keep pushing a little bit harder and like get ahead of this and, um, yeah, it just, it, it was, it's been a, it's been a crazy ride. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think we quickly, quickly learned a lot of lessons um, from the whole working from home dynamic um, and also what it takes to be a steward of the client and not necessarily like, I guess, I guess what I want to say most is that there's a lot of value in the inexperience and the fact that you can come to the table as like this malleable, um, fresh person who has is full of ideas but you have a much lower billing rate <laughs> and aside from that um it's it's really just about like feeling the freedom to shake things up a little bit when while you have the energy to do it um that was kind of our experience and at first it started that way and then towards the end we ended up kind of experiencing a lot of uh, not hostility but we weren't comfortable with our work environment anymore, or at least we had ended up, ended up being separated. Um, and Kyle was working on site and I was working off site. And yeah, I, it's, this is all a little bit fresh, but pretty much like yeah. <laughs> we, we kind of went on two different trajectories. Derek, he stayed in the office and he started gaining responsibilities yeah. outside of design. So he was working on administrative work, um, some accounting stuff. <laughs> so like really things outside of his, skill set. And I was, you know, I was doing the same. I was getting a lot of really grunt work um, on the site because when, whenever you're starting, um, for those who are not as familiar with construction, um, typically uh, whoever's on the lowest part of the totem pole is going to get some like pretty lame jobs. Um, so I was getting a lot of that, but also working alongside carpenters um, and learning pretty much the other side of the industry. Um, and I think, you know, obviously because this is really fresh, it's it's difficult to like reflect on this and like synthesize it in like a really, <laughs> I don't know, cohesive way. But I, I think ultimately um, it's, it's interesting and it's beneficial that we were able to go on these different trajectories and then, um, you know. Circle back on what we were missing. Right, yeah. And, and I, I think I have two I have two notes that I wanted to just say before we sign off because I'm sure we're approaching our 10 minute mark of rambling. But uh, I think both of us and probably everyone on this call feels pressure to stay at a steady job and and restabilize and find balance um, through the position that you're hired to do. Um, and I would say right now that I. We, I mean, I felt a lot of pressure to stay because it's a pandemic and because I wanted a steady job, even though the work environment wasn't healthy. Um, and frankly, 
getting out was really easy to think about, but really hard to do. And ultimately there is no wasted time there though. Like I learned a lot in my time, the, the year that we had, but um, ultimately the, the, the connections that you make as a person are a much stronger thing to rely on than the connections you make through your, the entity that you represent, like your, the business or the corporation that you're, you're signing drawings or, or designing things for. It's a small world. <laughs> Philly is a small city. Yeah. And so that I just wanted to like, maybe be the devil's advocate of like, you don't have to feel the pressure to find a steady job right now. Tap your networks, like just focus on what you need to develop and you'll be fine. Cause if you're passionate about it, you motivate yourself. So you don't need a, you don't need a whip crack. <laughs> Thank That's you guys. Awesome. Thank you guys for that. Uh, nice. Uh, change of direction um, and a different outlook. Um, so now that everyone has spoken, we will open this up to just sort of a general discussion. Um, if anyone has questions, you are free to either unmute yourself and ask or just put it in the chat and I'll ask the question to our guests for you. I have one. Ask away. Andrew, how in the world did you hear about Corey View Building Group? Because <laughs> we are so tiny. Because <laughs> I have family in York and Lancaster, and okay. I know about heavy timber framing, and we hired them to do a project in Bucks County a long time ago. Okay. Yeah, Beautiful. and we had to design them, and we worked with somebody, and I really wish that there was a designer on their team, but they were yeah. really friendly and helpful. Yeah. And they knew their stuff, and they did a good did. job. What yeah. year was that? Uh, probably before you were in school. Okay. Yeah, like 2013, 2013, 2014, I think. Yeah. Yeah, but it was awesome. And like yeah. this client really wanted timber frames. And we were like, we need somebody that's going to engineer and know how to put it together. Mm -hmm. We don't have a lot of time for this. We need somebody to come in and know what they're doing. And everybody was like, oh, you want timber frames? Well, that's going to be kind of expensive. Yeah. And we were like, mm. and my, I was going out to see my family in New York. And I was like, I'm going to stop by this place and see what yeah. they, boom. Yep. Yeah. It's a small world. Design is, I mean, it's a small world. Yeah. It's a small world. It's, yeah. There's not a ton of us designers out there. Chances are somebody knows you, you know somebody, or you know somebody that knows somebody. I, it's just, I got to say, I'm having like flashbacks because I graduated into the Great Recession. So I feel for all of you guys because it's exactly what we went through. We had like a year and then all of a sudden everybody was the youngest person on the totem pole and they were like, Pfft. And like, there was two of us out of 50 who were even working for an architecture firm. So like you guys are doing, I mean, <laughs> you guys are doing a lot better than my, my graduating class. But I got to say like, one of the reasons why I stayed in Philly was exactly what you guys were saying. You have more of a network than you realize that you have. Um, it's really amazing. And your education has taught you how to think and problem solve which means you're way more useful. So it's not at all surprising that you guys are not just doing and succeeding at, I'm not saying that it's easy, it's definitely hard, but I'm, it's not surprising that you're succeeding at a bunch of other jobs too, right? Engineering, photography, design, interior, like interiors, even if it's not what you expected. I, I think that that proves your resilience of your, your education. Anyway, I'm, I'm, this is Sal's thing, not mine. No, I think that was actually very helpful. Um, when I graduated, some of the people from my internship had also graduated during the recession and were trying to find a job. So it was very helpful to be able to, re to relate to other people who have been through it, who have really nice jobs now, you know, who are steady, have families, have a life, you know. So I think that's something that, um, like, just talking to people about, you know, kind of what you're going through, because you know, it felt like at the time we like, you felt all the weight of, okay, not to find a job and nobody's hiring. There's nothing there. And how am I gonna, you know, move on from this? But then you're like, oh wait, everybody else that I graduated with is in the same exact boat that I'm in. So I think it's helpful to have people to kind of rely on and, and fall back on a little bit. Awesome. Um, so some questions are now rolling into the chat. Um, so the first one, um, 
So as there's tense happens to be a current theme among the current fifth year students, um, uh, where a few sort of have a feeling um, and don't really believe there's anything substantial in the work that we've done over the past few years for our portfolios. Um, so uh, this question is, did any of you guys feel that way before graduating that your portfolio was kind of like not good enough or like the work you did in school was just kind of like, what were you even doing of sorts? Um, and if so, how did you sort of gain that confidence in your work or what'd you really do to kind of like fix that? I can like say a little thing about this, I guess. My like, like viewpoint on my portfolio, I guess, like when I went into making it was like how to create a representation of myself, not necessarily a representation of my work. So like, what are the things I care most about? What were my favorite projects? And if they're ugly, like, can I redraw some stuff and make it look nice? And like something that actually like the firm that hired me um, complimented me on was that my portfolio was like super cohesive throughout and like I had like a sense of branding like through my portfolio and my resume and when I had my interview at TV Bob we literally did not look at my portfolio we just talked about like life uh, which was really nice because I mean like not every firm is going to do that but like that was really great for me to like experience because I got to feel for who they were they got to understand who I was and they already like knew that I was like had an attention to detail like they didn't care about like what the projects were necessarily or like the actual substance of it as long as it's like clear that you worked hard on them and like you know how to present your work if that makes sense um that would be like my biggest takeaway the other thing that got me an interview during the pandemic was that I put the AIS t-shirt that I designed in my portfolio which is the dog's as famous architects. And I got an interview at Re Revision simply, and they weren't even, they were hiring someone with like three years of experience. And they were like, we wanna talk to you because we like the dog shirt. And I was just like, okay, cool. Um, so yeah, I don't know, don't be afraid to like put photography or any other like random stuff that you are interested in on your resume or portfolio. Um, just like show them who you are. Can I, can I piggyback off of that? Um, so you might think that you don't have anything interesting to talk about in your portfolio because the pictures aren't as pretty as you're used to or you've seen in the past. Um, and I will, I'll, for a foot in the, like the pretty pictures get your foot in the door, um, but they're not really what gets you the job. It's, it's more about what you talk about and who you are as a person, exactly like Teresa's saying. Um, I literally got the job I got because of I put ping pong on my resume. Like it just gave them a little bit of like, oh, this is like a human being that we can talk to, you know? Like, um, <laughs> I just I just think that the the work that you show, to, to Teresa's point, the work that you showcase is the work you're going to get. The work you do is the work you get. Um, so if you're looking to like curate your portfolio to a specific firm, um, I don't think it's necessarily worth the time. I think you should just, worry about focusing on the work you've done that you've been inspired by and that you are excited to talk about. And they'll read your excitement um, while you present your work and it'll go from there. And I'm saying that as someone that really relied on the portfolio, like the technique with interviewing where you have a portfolio and a printed one, it's a nice paper and you put it in front of them and you let them flip through at their leisure and then you talk about what they're interested in. And what I'm realizing now in this Zoom culture is that you, yeah, sure, you can share your screen and go through it, but it's not the same, like you're steering the ship and ultimately they don't really, like it, the, the, the field has changed. It's not about the, the work that you're presenting, it's about how fun you are to talk to and if you are a human being that will bring them joy yeah, in this seriously. strange world. Yeah, because we're all just so starved for human interaction that like that <laughs> it's literally like <laughs> also <See you. laughs> just like putting this out there that I'm going to be at Design Expo this year. <laughs> so I might see some of you guys <laughs> and I'm certainly going to be looking for human beings. So <laughs> just to add to that, as I mentioned before during this talk, um, it's a small world. Um, so probably know someone at LinkedIn or 
someone to help them out. Also, there's actually a benefit in being young. There's, for me, my firm is a pretty older firm. So like they didn't know all of the, the new BIM stuff. So they had to focus on getting young people in to help them with that. So, I mean, so being young and then knowing Revit and knowing you learn how to like work around it real well, real well. Um, there's probably firms out there that need help with Revit, trying to convert their firm to CAD. Um, from my experience, there's the architecture world is still heavily into CAD and, and some are, and the transition is very slow and especially with older people having to learn it. Um, um, but basically the portfolio, um, I tried to tailor my portfolio towards like me. So like how much, how I was pretty involved in school and my projects were there and, um, you know, experimenting during my time in school and then like my craft and showing that instead of trying to show like pretty pictures or good plans or good details, try to make, make sure that my portfolio kind of connected with me in a way. Um, but fortunately, got the benefit of just knowing someone that needed help and wanted to bring me on. And does anyone else um, have anything to add to that question? Um, I have something. I feel like Teresa covered it, but I was also complimented on the same thing Teresa was complimented on. Uh, the architect was like, the architect was like, how did you make this so like cohesive? Like your style, I could see it in every single project, even though the projects don't relate to each other. Um, and that's coming from like, I was applying into the transportation and infrastructure division, which like their clients are like the MTA and SEPTA and I, none of my projects have anything to do with trains or, you know, stations. And um, when I was asked that question, I didn't even get the chance to answer because another architect was holding my portfolio and was like, well, none of her projects have done that. But if you see the consistency in her work, like that, shows us everything and like the way that you talk about your project as well is really important like it might be one of like your most hated projects in school but if you talk about it and talk about the key things that like you were really passionate about like especially in your fifth year the project that you work on really find that one thing that like gravitates you and talk about that and if they see that you're this like big ball of energy and especially right now like that's what they want in architecture firms they're not going to want like <laughs> some <laughs> reserve like right now that's what they need especially like everyone's working at home um yeah i think they're looking for humans they're looking for you to be yourself you're not meant to be a robot you know so yeah that's what i wanted to add to Teresa. <laughs> yeah um one like quick note i guess because i don't want you guys to feel like you have to redraw all of your projects to make them cohesive like that's one thing that you could like if you have like an, a good baseline don't feel like you need to put all that work in um Derek's, Derek's in the chat like that's not the way for everyone um but one thing that like interviewing over zoom does like give you an advantage on is that you can just spend time on one project if you want to um obviously you have to submit your whole thing if you're going to do like design expo or usually you submit your portfolio to a firm, but the like most successful interviews I had digitally were, I had one that was like, all right, this is this project. And then they were like, all right, show us the next one. And then it was just like, so it was awful. I was just like, all right. And then I did this and then I did this and then I did this and I didn't end up wanting to work for that firm, but I didn't get that job anyway. The one that went really well was when I like, focused on my one project that I actually cared about and was like here's all the things I like and all the work that I put into it um oh Andrew said did you practice Zoom interviews I did not I don't know if anyone else did 
I can maybe answer this question. <laughs> I, mean, I, I feel like I'm not the best person to ask about interviews and portfolios because I feel like I've done very little of it. As you've heard, I uh, got the job I currently had through Derek <laughs> just through like recommendation. But um, one of my very first interviews was actually a Zoom interview and it was before the pandemic. Um, and in my opinion, it was like, probably the most successful interview I'd had because I had done design expo like my second year and my third year. Um, but the Zoom interview really just gives you a lot of abilities that you don't have like when you're just like there in person, just like, like I was able to just pull up, you know, work that maybe wasn't even related. Like it just kind of, I mean, it's definitely based on like your personality, but like I have a very sporadic, like my brain will just like pop one thing to the next and like, maybe someone like Enya, who is a very cohesive and straightforward portfolio <laughs> and goes <laughs> a bit from an in-person interview. But um, I don't know, I think, uh, yeah, it just, it was a, it was a really positive experience um, for me in my, my process and using, doing interviews. <laughs> uh, I have uh, a little bit, um, I practiced Zoom interviews. Uh, I practiced interviews a lot. I had a good friend of mine. She really helped me out. She would be on the other side of the screen. You know, we would we would go through resume, uh, make it better, practice interviews, and I think that's really set me up. Now, my final interview was in person, um, but you know, I think it just helped boost my confidence in getting the interviews done. Um, I had a few over the phone and not really any Zoom interviews, but still uh, practicing kind of helped get the answers that I want to uh, want to have from talking. So I'm not like just rambling. Uh, I could structure it where, you know, you start off by answering their questions, go into a little bit of a story, and then at the end, you tailor it, it back to the answer of the question. So that it kind of like like an essay solidifies your points. I also, I haven't done an interview over Zoom, but I've definitely done a lot of hard conversations over Zoom and having a script is really, really helpful. Um, and one beautiful thing about this strange era that we're in is that right now you can't tell where I'm looking. And most people, when they're zooming, are looking at themselves to see how ridiculous they look. So you could, I could be holding paper right here. You don't know. So try that out if you need to. And I would, I would say literally the exact opposite. So it really depends on your personality. <laughs> I, I can't work off a script. I need to just. I think when I did it, I had like talking points because like I always forget um the things I like about myself or my work so I like wrote them down to be like hey make sure you talk about the easy stupid idiot um and that was helpful and also like I had another thought and I forgot it maybe it'll come back all right um so for a few more uh two more questions that just came in um first one being um as they're still portfolio related, um, the difference between quality or quantity. Um, so um, for instance, if you're using a portfolio that only had like two to three projects, would it be better to just add more, just have like that volume. Or if those are really good projects, just keep those. But also if you had a really interesting project that wasn't finished yet, and obviously as a fifth year student isn't gonna be finished until the end of the semester, would you still include it? I did. Um, it was kind of weird. I actually like was updating my portfolio as I went, which is another thing that's actually really, I never printed my portfolio. Um, so it makes it super easy to update with your most current graphics uh, as you're going. Um, I was in the solar decathlon. So my project was like very text and diagram heavy and like super technical. I didn't have a lot of like orthogonals or even really renderings um, for my project. So it definitely looked a little bit clunky in my portfolio, but that was the project I talked most about because it was the one that was going on and I could actually ask 
for their opinions on it, which they really liked because it's more engaging than like, here's what I did and it's done. Um, so I would like really encourage you to do that. Um, as for the quality over quantity question, um, from my experience from the one like Zoom interview that I had, um, I pretty much just like started going through my portfolio and I think I had about like six projects and by like the third one, you could tell that they kind of just like didn't, not that they didn't care, but they just wanted me to like go faster and like move through it. So I like, I would say that three three projects is perfectly acceptable because kind of by that point, like they get to see who you are and like what your work is like by that point. So, and it just kind of saves you some breath too, because like I wanted to talk about it, but they kind of just seemed a little disinterested. Um, so keeping it short, I definitely think is um, acceptable and would benefit you. I agree with that too, because um, I have like two portfolios, one that has all like of my projects that I really, really like six of them. And then one that has three, and that's the one I use for Zoom interviews because it's like, I have more of the project and more that I like about it. So I focus on those three. And then, and I remember everything. If I said everything for the six, I'd be too overwhelmed. So I think that would be a good thing because then they can also just focus on the three and it shows like you're passionate about those three projects too. So maybe if you had two separate portfolios, that could be helpful. Yeah, I think this, um, ju just totally jumping off of what Gabby just said, like, I think this is another example of like a change in format. Um, because I think I used to think, I used to believe that a thick portfolio with a lot of projects, um, I can, again, let them kind of pick what they choose and talk about what they're interested in and what they're attracted to. Um, but ultimately that doesn't work anymore. Like it's, it's about one to two projects that you really care about that you'll have the opportunity to refer to. And um, ultimately you, the portfolio doesn't matter as much as the skills you gain building the portfolio. That's something I've really noticed is that I, and I'm super obsessive about portfolios and details and how meticulous documents go together. And that's not some, uh, yeah. So it, what I'm trying to say is that most of that effort is wasted. It's, it's more about having something that is uh, uh, a jump start for the conversation. These yeah, just really, to, yeah. these are really interesting. Sorry, Kyle. These are really interesting points that you guys are bringing up. And I think it's really important that you're already realizing it because you guys are seeing it in the interviews that you're having. Like the interviewer, old school, you go to the office, walk into their office, you're on their turf, right? That's not the case anymore. And I think that's really important. So not only are they managing the interview, but you're managing the interview too, right? You're managing their time. They're trying to see if they, like they're trying to hire somebody that's gonna be a coworker. Are they gonna fit well? Are they gonna be able to deal with awkwardness? Are they gonna be able to move around stuff? Can they organize themselves to kind of deal with me in a way that is works with how I work? So if you're with a really like buttoned up firm, it's gonna be very different. Like it might be very structured. If you're with somebody that's like, listen, I would rather just talk to you in person, uh, are you comfortable with meeting on the sidewalk, right? It's going to be very different. So it's interesting. I think it's very interesting. You guys have realized that like the power has shifted. And I mean, listen, I had a freshman tell me how to do something on the computer. It was very humbling the other day. So you guys are way more agile in the digital universe than the people that are interviewing you. And so that's your asset. That's your strength. Yeah, just by virtue of being young, you have already put your foot in the door, which is a really weird thing to say. But it's super true, right? Like, yeah, I just remember every single internship that I've had has been, wow, Derek, this is a new software. Wow, that's so cool. I had nothing to do with it. I just showed it to them because that's what was available. So, and that's going to, I think that is only going to accelerate for people coming out of school now. So that's All exciting. Right. Um, I'm going to ask one more portfolio related question then we're going to move on from portfolios. Um, did you guys find when making your portfolios um, choosing between either a booklet format 
or sort of like a more web page format like Adobe Portfolio or something? Yeah, this is actually what I was going to respond to earlier, but um, yeah, I, I, it's very fresh in my memory um, because like in the past week I've been applying to places and um, you know, a lot of places when you're applying, they have like a limit on like the amount of space that you can submit the file to. And so. it's, it's a quick test of your ability to synthesize your graphics and your work and tell the story in a shortened or different version. Um, because that's something you're going to have to do with your work, like for the rest of your careers, you're going to have to reformat it in a million different ways. Um, and that goes back to what Derek was saying, where it's, it's about the process of actually doing the portfolio more, so, almost more so than like, even how people are perceiving it. It's like, you're going to put so much work into this thing. That's just, no, it's in some ways thankless to, <laughs> to the people that are actually seeing it. They're going to have no idea how much work you put into this, but they're going to get this sort of vibe, you know, they're going to get this vibe that you like are confident about it and in doing the work and synthesizing it and having such control over um, the presentation of it is going to be what gives them that, that sense that you're confident about your work and that you know what you're talking about. Um, a quick note on like the website portfolio thing. I know that Behance is like super pushed. Um, at Philly or Jefferson. Um, but my experience, like sometimes if you're with a firm that they're really not tech savvy, they don't know, um, like if you just include the link to your Behance, like your page, they don't know which portfolio to go to or, or that you can scroll or like anything like that. So like making it as simple as possible um, for the people on the other end is like super important. And like PDFs are the universal language for a lot of firms so that was I mean my experience was it was super easy to just pdf from indesign um I didn't do any page numbers because like some of the firms I applied to was like a five megabyte limit and my portfolio is like 50 megs or something and rather than compressing that to like one pixel I would just take out a few projects and then you can curate it if, if like if you Think you can curate it to like what the firm would be interested in seeing you can just take out a few that's that was my experience i was i was going to type this out but i thought it it was too long so um i would also say that this is weird but kind of meeting people where they're at as far as the people that will review your work most of the time when a company a small company or a medium-sized company they're hiring someone it's off hours, right? It's, it's people that aren't actually like clocked in to do that thing, um, which means that most of the time they're gonna be reviewing your work on their phone. So if you're sending an email um, or calling, which I would recommend calling is really effective, but if you're sending an email, um, don't just attach your portfolio, attach a screenshot of a rendering, you know, like make them engaged in your work um, just from the initial get go, because they're going to be looking at it on a screen this big. They're not going to, they're not going to download your PDF, open it in their PDF viewer, tab through, you know, and if they are doing that, they're not just doing it for you. So if you're trying to stand out, just send an email with a screenshot embedded. I think that really goes a long way. All right. Um, so uh, for those of you who, actually, I mean, really for all of you, this applies, but um, in terms of grad school, do you guys think as of right now that's a good option or possibly even a better option than trying to find a full-time job? Can I answer this as someone who chose not to go to grad school? Yeah. So I've already found, and I'm sure this applies to everybody, but I've already found myself in a lot of debt. So adding more debt to that just because I'm trying to push off finding a full-time position in the long run is just literally just basically killing yourself of like why do that to yourself unless you're like your intentions and what you want to do and what you want to go for is good um it's just obviously graduating you're growing up and you're going into the adult world and you're buying cars and you're getting married and all these fun things. So it's like, oh wait, that's a lot of money that I have to pay back. So like just save yourself and like kind of evaluate like what do I wanna do um, and go from there. So yeah. 
but that's just my take on somebody who didn't go to grad school. So I'm just, yeah, like, I think Maddie could probably answer this pretty good. Um, and kind of her take as to what, not trying to call you out, Maddie, but yeah. <laughs> Sorry, my computer froze for a second there. So I think I just, <laughs> I don't know what happened the last minute. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, as someone who is currently in grad school, um, I did, I went right away, um, started the fall semester after I graduated in spring. Um, I mean, I was already planning on going and enrolled before this whole pandemic happened. Um, and part of the reason why I am doing it is because like Jefferson has a four plus one program for interiors and sustainable design. So it was a cheaper option for grad school because um, I do it in a shorter amount of time. But I wouldn't say that it's something to do just to do because it is a pandemic. Like I know I've talked to like some of my friends and they potentially talk about grad school but they don't know what they wanna do with it yet. Like you definitely need the time to figure out exactly like what that other degree is that you would wanna go for. Um, like definitely don't go into grad school because like, oh, it's an extra degree. Like I can make more money, like all those kind of things. You wanna make sure that you're passionate about it. Um, and yeah, there's so many opportunities out there that you probably don't even know about. So if it's not something you're super set on right away, I would recommend just taking the time to figure out what you want, kind of like what Michaela was talking about. Uh, I sort of did a half measure. So I took, um, as one of my minors, I took uh, master level courses in real estate. Um, so now I can choose to uh, go back to finish that and I'll have already 12 credits done. Um, real estate was something that I got interested as I got uh, internships. And right now I work with uh, Monarch Investment and Management, which is the 13th largest owner operation uh, in the United States. Um, so, you know, in the future, I'm probably going to go back to do grad school uh, and finish up the last 12 credits. But I think taking advantage of uh, getting those 12 credits while you still can at the same price, at a cheaper price than what they would be for going back and getting your your master's um i think it's a good step to kind of get your foot in the door see what it'll be like uh and you know maybe you don't like it maybe you do like it it's a good way to kind of test it out awesome um so um, we wait, have can i say one right, more thing go that? ahead sorry um so i think also too with um grad school and stuff is like kind of, I think for me, like graduating in the middle of pandemic, not really knowing where I was going from there, it kind of made me um, not reevaluate, but like kind of look at myself and like really reflect on what I was doing and where I wanted to go. Um, and I would encourage you to kind of be in that uncomfortable situation of like, like grad school, you can always go back to you know, you can always go and you can always educate and you can always learn more. But, you know, if you jump into it right away, it's kind of like, okay, you know, you have like everybody said in the group chat, you like, you have to weigh your options. Um, but for me personally, I found um, like more who I am, what I wanted to do, you know, what I was looking for in a career. Yeah, you got to lean to discomfort a little bit, you know, so <laughs> But yeah, I like my motto for last year was um, was just like being comfort comfortable in the uncomfort that you are in, like the season that you're in. So if that makes sense. Could I chime in for a second? Go right ahead. Uh, as a professor of this program and as someone who went to grad school at the same time as uh, Professor Hard, we both went to grad school at a time when it was uh, the recession was happening. While not a pandemic, it was a very, very hard time for architects to get jobs. We were one of the most hard hit industries. Um, and grad school was a decision that neither of us, I'm not speaking for Andrew, but we were talking a lot of the time, 
neither of us took very lightly because it is a, a massive financial investment, but we also knew it was the path to what we both wanted to do, which was to teach. So I would always uh, urge any student who's thinking about grad school, and not to say I didn't have a great experience, I loved my time in grad school, to really consider the financial obligations that come with it, the potential additional debt, but also is it really going to benefit your career? It's yes, it's nice to have a master's degree, but will it really give you what you're looking for? Sometimes the answer is no, sometimes it is yes. Weigh out those options, it's incredibly important. Hell yeah, Betty. <laughs> All right, um, so we have gone on for about an hour. So I'm thinking it's a good time to sort of wrap this up. Um, so if anyone has any uh, final statements or anything they'd like to add, um, now's the time for that. Mikhail is dropping the knowledge. She's already unmuted. Uh, yeah, I, I'm like, because I saw this in the group chat and I was hoping that we would talk about it. Um, but it was about hiring like interns and uh, internships and just hiring in general. Um, the work is definitely out there. Um, you just kind of have to look. I'm saying this because like my company right now, we are in desperate need. We are growing very quickly. Um, but, you know, I think some things that you have to kind of look at is like um, for my standpoint or from my standpoint, being the designer at a company that specializes in timber frame, learning the, the trade kind of before. So even if you come in and you're an intern as a laborer, like that's very important. And the experiences that you get from that, um, you know, really feed in, like really feed into that, your role that you could be potentially going into. Like as an interior doing some building structures and all that kind of stuff, it definitely took a lot to learn, but because I had some previous experience within high school and some different moments in college and stuff, it was, um, I was able to catch on very quickly and like already knew kind of the structures of how a building all comes together. Obviously school helped that too, but like we are definitely hiring. Um, I know a lot of other places are, and they're looking for like young people that are very eager, very passionate, um, the main reason, well, one of the main reasons why um, there was three of us that were hired basically at the same time um, for all different positions. Um, the main reason is because we were eager to learn. So if you're eager to learn, I think a hundred percent, like you're there, you're bound to find somewhere that you want to go. So mic drop right there. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Add on what Michaela said, being eager to learn. Um, I actually had to come into my firm learning ArchiCAD, which is essentially um, Revit's rival. Um, not many people know it. So I know my job where they're trying to like basically get it as a standard in their firm. And one of the people that used to work there moved to another company. And she told me that like, being a firm trying to hire people that know ArchiCAD is pretty difficult. So like, usually you have to come in and the training and I had to do the same thing. And I think usually those firms, um, including ours, are always looking for um, people to learn ArchiCAD because not, pe not many people really know it and are that good at the software. And to add on to Aaron, one last thing. Um, like for me, they hi I told them the programs that I knew. And then the first day of my job, I had to use this program called MicroStation and I've been using it for the past six months. And I only had like two, three days to learn it, but they didn't, they didn't not hire me because I didn't know the program. They saw that like they, they see that if you're willing to learn something new and that you can prove that you're a fast learner, then uh, you can pick up on it and be very beneficial to the company as well. Yeah, I think going like back to what Enya was saying and Aaron was saying, and also with the portfolios too, just to kind of sum that stuff up, like our my first interview with the company that I'm at, um, 
he was like, I'm bringing you in literally just to get to know you. He's like, I could care less of what you do. He's like, I just want to know if you fit with the, with the company. And I was like, oh, okay. Like, so it was just a breeze to have that kind of like informal type of discussion. Um, but I think most people are right now are just looking for, like Teresa said, that human interaction um, that we are, have been so deprived of for these last couple of months. Um, but yeah, I think people are definitely eager and they're definitely willing to meet and wanting to meet um, the graduates, the upcoming graduates. So definitely keep your, don't let your hopes down. I wanted to like touch on something that we kind of talked about earlier, but um, I think this was actually the thought that I had earlier that I forgot. So coming back, um, we talked about like human interaction a lot and just being personable. And I think a big part of the way that firms are thinking right now, at least my firm is like, they're asking me like, oh, do you know people who have work experience who can work for us? Because they're so, there's like, it's hard to train people it's hard to get to know people over the internet so if you know that it's someone that you can trust or that someone you know can trust then that's a big thing so like going back to building up your network and Philly is a small town try to get involved in local organizations if you can I just did a woman in architecture meeting um, and I would really recommend that group Susan Froston is in it so I got to hang out with Susan last week uh, <laughs> But there's, there's a lot of different things like that, NOMAS. Um, I don't know how much the AIA has been doing um, over Zoom, but there's gonna be like speed mentoring for like women in architecture group that I would really recommend um, just sort of getting to know people that way. And also don't, don't feel, I know there's this pressure to get a job, but like take your time, like find what's right. Um, don't just jump right into something because it's the first offer that you get. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I think I just got a little bit off track there, but I would, the, my biggest piece of advice would be to like get to know people as people, show them that you're capable and stay in contact with them and they'll remember you. I just, I was gonna say the same kind of thing, Teresa, like recommendations right now and and actually always are so valuable. And you don't think you know a lot of people, but you know a lot of people simply because you all know Carol Herman and you all know Lisa Phillips. Boom, right? I mean, right there is people that know people. And so I think that, and, and Kim Douglas, and I mean, <laughs> like, right, David Briner and Susan Frostein, these are people that have been out and have, networks because they know lots of students um i just want you guys to know that like just because you guys have graduated does not mean the faculty doesn't have your back right like you guys know that the thing that drives us is you and we want you to come back for reviews and we want you to and we want you to to you know pay back what your thanks were for alumni that came back to talk to you to the students now but equally um, we want students now to connect up to you guys. Um, so this is my lead into a question of how best should people get in touch with you? Like, what's the best for you to get in touch with? Our emails at the university right now are insane. Insane. What's the best way to get in touch with you guys if there's questions or follow-ups? Easiest way, it seems like Instagram. Yeah, like I checked my... I, mean, I can give you guys my email. I checked my email, um, but sometimes- Don't give like, it now because we're going to post it. So don't yeah, give it now. Yeah. Uh, just, yeah, in terms of like getting to know people, there's like such a huge social media, like obviously it's always been big, but I think I, re I would agree with Instagram. I would not, everyone has different opinions on LinkedIn. Um, I don't use it. I, some people use it. I it's never it's never given me anything that I like I've never gotten anything back from what I've given to LinkedIn so I don't know Aaron Aaron did a shout out I, I said Noma in the chat and Aaron did a shout out for Noma in the chat No Mas is a great organization its parent organization Noma is so important if you are a person that should be a member of that that 
group, you should be a member of that group. It is an excellent, excellent. And Noma is showing up, I think, in a much bigger way than AIA is right now. And I cannot, I cannot emphasize that enough. There is now Noma is the National Organization of Minority Architects. And Aaron, do you want to talk about it just a little bit? Um, yeah, sure. Um, so Noma is actually the way I got hired. Um, some guy I knew, I actually asked to interview him about like being a firm owner. He ended up remembering me from this. What was it? It was a it was a summer camp to teach teach kids architecture. Um, and that's how I got hired. Um, it's pretty cool. Like besides the summer camp, you know, they try to get the student organizations involved. Um, they are focused on basically trying to champion diversity, essentially. Um, so like one of the things they did is like getting, I think it's the 50 by 50, the Black Spectacles um, partnership, which I actually got involved trying to get people licensed, um, get more diversity, um, more diverse architects out there. Um, I don't know what else to add to it. Um, I mean, I'm just saying there's a lot of people, especially Noma and Philly, there's a ton of people at Jefferson that are connected to Noma Philly, um, that are connected to Women in Architecture, WIA, that are connected to Young Friends of the Preservation Alliance, YFPA, that are connected to AIA Associates and the Young Architects Forum. And the reason to be involved in those organizations is not just to move your career forward, it also is to like find new friends, explore other stuff that's cool about design that's not just nine to five um it's also a support network so you know my study group for accreditation we're all a bunch of old heads who should have our licenses already like this is really it's helpful to find people that are doing what you're doing but that are not necessarily in the same circle that you've been in and that only benefits your life uh, to quickly add to what Andrew just said about studying, I, um, like, because I didn't get a job right away, I started studying for the first part of the NCIDQ, um, yeah, <laughs> and also I really, I didn't go to grad school, but I was super um, passionate and excited to learn about sustainability. So I also signed up to do the Lead Green Associate exam, and you can do, like, um, study groups with that and I'm in one and it's super fun because you get to talk to people you wouldn't normally meet and learn like basically in school with friends but it's just on zoom so I would recommend that as well um we had, I, we had kind of switched gears a little bit um I'd wanted to kind of state this a little bit earlier and I, I hope this isn't a buzzkill but and maybe it, maybe it's inspiring in some ways. So I want, wanted to say that between architecture and interior design, um, this is a, a volatile field. Um, that's been super clear from the teachings of Andrew and, and Betty and their experience and the experiences that we're living through now where the entire middle group of architectural staff have been fired from large firms, right? The people that stuck around were the principals and the, the, the interns, the youngest people that could produce the work at a higher speed um, and get paid shit for it. So I think, I, think, I think the most important thing right now to realize, in, in my experience at least, and this is, I'm open to contest, is that you shouldn't put all your eggs in one basket unless the basket is you. So, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's becoming really clear to a lot of people what value that we bring. And we are the people that value ourselves the least. So don't be afraid to kind of push your agenda and, and push your, your expertise because 
there's a reason that you're even involved. And it's because you help people. So I heard, yeah, I'm going to tangent though. I heard this really troubling thing from, uh, from one of our uh, firm crawls two years ago. It was with Cosca Moose, which is a firm I applied to. And I remember getting denied by them because I didn't have enough built work or, or I didn't have enough, my projects weren't real enough. And they had said in their, in our firm crawl, uh, the architects get into the world to solve problems and change the world. And the contractors get into the project to make money. And I don't think that that's universal. And I think that it's a really jaded opinion. So I hope that people will do the work to bridge that gap and, and you know, make your shit happen. <laughs> Maybe I'm rambling a little bit. Definitely am. Gabby nodded. In the, in the words of one of my favorite independent studies right now, I'm here to make cool shit. So that's your AIS president, by the way, just shouting out to her. I know she's listening in. <laughs> Sal, what's up next for more digital demos? What are we looking for in this new Zoom era? Um, as of right now in this new Zoom era, um, well, on YouTube, we'll be uh, soon releasing some videos um, sort of on short tips and such, um, such as managing Photoshop layers, um, things you might not have known about, such as like lookup tables and HDR tone mapping, um, as well as Olivia will be doing some stuff on like drawing trees and a few other things as well. Nice. So we're going to have like mini demos, like yes. easy, easy to sit down and enjoy with a cup of coffee. Little, little demo snacks. Little demo snacks. Nice. And then also coming up a little bit later, um, also coming up a little bit later, I have some talks that are going to be coming up that are like not the full on lecture, but it's supposed to be more engaging. So we have, um, we have a recent grad from out in Kansas who's involved with Dark Matter University. Um, we're setting up a time to interview him to talk about diversity issues in architecture. Uh, I have reached out to a couple of firms to just kind of talk about like the behind the scenes. So not the like, hey, check out my work and this is awesome because it all worked out and I'm not going to tell you the behind the scenes story, but to actually talk about, yeah, demo nuggets. Uh, as Sal has been calling them, but also to say like, so what did you learn? Like, what was your hardest project? What was the project that went sideways? Um, so we're hoping that those will be like, like maybe like shorter, like half hour things that are easier to do. Um, and so keep a look for Sal on Instagram. And, uh, and you can also check out Sal's independent study, which is pretty awesome on his own Instagram, just to do a shameless plug. But it's really cool because if you love donuts, then you should see the attack of the donut lord. It's just, that's all I'm saying. All right. Thank you very much, Andrew. And on that note, um, we are going to end off here. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, all of your insight and experience has been very great and very um, useful. Thank you guys for your knowledge and good night. <laughs>